uh, our special meeting. Um, and the first item on the agenda is uh, the Alco Renewable uh, Wind Power. And Mr. Fisher, are you the lead man here? Well, I would be here to make some introductions. Okay. Uh, I, my name is Bill Fisher. I appreciate the council's time uh, tonight being down in Tiverton. <clears throat> I own a company in Rhode Island, uh, and I'm a native Rhode Islander called Vision Strategies, which is a government relations, public relations, and marketing firm. Uh, and for the better part of the last year, uh, I've represented Alco Renewable Energy, particularly at the State House, uh, as uh, a gaggle of renewable energy bills were debated and passed. And one of the reasons we're here tonight is a bill that passed called the Virtual Net Metering Law, which allows uh, you folks to use town land uh, to develop renewable projects and attach that to any meter or account in your town. Uh, so, for instance, you could put up uh, solar panels on your DPW uh, and sh help offset uh, your electricity costs for uh, the elementary school around the corner and up the road. It physically doesn't need to be connected. Um, I want to introduce Keith Kelsman. Uh Keith is up from New York uh, and is a vice president of Alco Renewable Energy. Uh, has a lot of expertise in developing renewable projects around the country and particularly in financing those projects. And this is Stephanie De Silva from my office uh, as well, which is over in Cranston, Rhode Island. Uh, unless you have any introductory questions, we have a presentation that Keith would like to go through uh, to discuss um, the process, what we're uh, envisioning in Tiverton. Uh, and I turn it over to Mr. Peltzman, if that's okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Town Council, for having me today. Um, before I dig into this, I, I do need to correct you. I've been called many things in my life, but I've never been called a New Yorker. So uh, I said from New York. I'm, I'm not from New York. I need to set the record straight right here. <laughs> the office is in New York. I actually, yeah, I'm based in uh, Philadelphia. Um, so I would like to see the Dodgers lose as well. But uh, what I want to do is just real quickly do an overview of wind, what the opportunity is for wind here in Tiverton, and feel free to jump in with questions at any time. We can just make this kind of a back and forth rather than a formal presentation. I don't know how much folks here in the audience understand about wind or how much depth to go into, so I think any time's appropriate to shout out. All right, so if we can jump right in real quickly, I, I want to just try and provide the, the joke of the, uh, or I guess just the, uh, the fundamentals on the first two pages. A lot of folks are uh, looking at renewable energy. This bit maybe uh, a year or even six months ago, people would be asking, well, is this the time for it? Is the technology there? Does it make sense here? And I think what we're here to say is yes, this is something that makes sense right now in this area uh, for a few reasons. And uh, we'll get onto that on the next page. But what really the crux of what we're saying too is we're a little bit unique. There are folks, developers, who are going around proposing to different towns that you build wind turbines uh, to generate electricity for the town. What most of them are proposing, though, know, is that you bear the cost of that. They'll be a developer and they'll take a fee for that. Um, that gets you in the business of one, building and construction, constructing wind turbines, two, buying turbines, and then three, <coughs> operating turbines. And there aren't really that many towns that want to get into the business of running their own power plant. Um, there are certainly many risks to doing that. So, in all frankness, what you're potentially doing is you're giving away some of the upside or some fee to a developer, but you're taking all that risk off your book because what we're proposing is we buy the wind turbines, we take on the risk of permitting, approvals, studies, we take on the risk of constructing it, we then go ahead and operate and maintain the plant, and we sell the electricity back to you at a fixed price, much the same way you would buy it from a utility uh, as you do now. Okay. Um, so what we're really proposing is something that's no cost to the town. There's really no upfront costs, and there's immediate savings from day one based on what you're currently paying for your electricity. Um, this is generally a much safer route for the town to take than to kind of go into the business of, of building interns. And I think it's something that it, now that we're in 2008, almost 2009, there is awareness of. If this had been, again, three years ago, folks might say, I've never heard of this, or this is kind of crazy, or maybe I saw this in Germany, but I don't think you could turn on the, the news on any given night without seeing a commercial or an ad or someone showing a wind turbine, it seems to be kind of the, uh, the catch <coughs> icon right now. And so people in, in town, for the most part, are probably supportive and see this as a, as a good thing. 
there's certainly awareness now. And then finally, experience. Um, there are folks out there proposing to do this that are coming from other sectors. Maybe they operate traditional power plants and they want to get into wind. This is just what we do. This Alco is a renewable uh, energy development company. We, we own wind farms in the Midwest, in Minnesota, and developing wind farms uh, in various states. Um, I just want to touch on a point Keith, Keith made about timing. Uh, we've seen utility rates skyrocket. And I don't have to tell you, we saw a national grid with their 21% rate increase this year. They didn't have another 5% rate increase that was mentioned last week because of a fine they have to pay. You folks are currently engaged with the Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns. We are getting you know, powered about seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, that contract expires this December. Um, I've had cursory conversations with Dan Beardsley, and he, he clearly expects that is going to increase. He's hopeful that he can renew that contract for around 12 cents a kilowatt hour, which is national grid standard offer. So it's going to continue on the traditional utility side. It's going to continue to increase. So just breeze through the next slide is kind of an overview of the benefits of wind. Uh, of course, very first up front are our savings. We're, you know, certainly we all feel good about green, but no one's going to do this at a loss of, of revenue for the town. And what we're proposing is whatever you're currently paying for electricity, we'll uh, offer a rate that's added or better than that. Um, number two is hedge. What we would offer you is a long-term contract to purchase the electricity for 15 to 20 years. And with that comes predictability. So you'll know 20 years out exactly what you'll be paying for your electricity. That certainly makes it a lot easier to, to budget for the town as well as to plan for tax rates and tax assessments. Um, certainly with National Grid, they tend to have uh, price jumps that go up maybe 20% every three or four years, and it makes it tough to plan for your, uh, your electricity expenses. Um, so we can talk about that reliability. And then, of course, there's the elements of pride to be really one of the the first towns in the state to have a uh, wind turbine to offset most of your electricity with green wind energy. I think that's something that would really make folks proud to say, hey, this is, this is what our town did. We're really uh, leaders in the state. And this is not kind of what we call a, you know, green marketing. Wind is it's real clean energy. I mean, you're not burning any fossil fuels. You're not making any carbon dioxide by doing this. It is a, a significant uh, strategy to reduce uh, global warming. Via wind power. And then finally, independence. Certainly, you hear in this campaign season a lot of talk about energy independence. This is one way that our country can do this, is to make our electricity right here rather than importing natural gas from, from other countries. And finally, this is a little bit, something that's a little more academic, but the infrastructure for delivering electricity is, is aged here in, uh, in New England. And that's one of the reasons that the electric utilities are fearing blackouts and just distribution issues. By making the electricity here in the town, you're taking some of that pressure off of the grid uh, for future as well. So before I go into about us, does anyone just want to jump in with questions on anything so far or just dig deep? I just keep going. Okay. A little bit about us. You see what we do is renewable energy project development. Um, really, we handle everything from soup to nuts. So project financing, engineering and construction, and the operation and maintenance. Uh, we have projects throughout the U.S. Uh, our background is primarily in the kind of finance and the tax and law on the policy side to help develop renewable projects. Um, the work we've done has been primarily with governments. So uh, the principles of ALCO have arranged for financing for water wastewater treatment plants, uh, for rail terminals, uh, for traditional utility plants, for airports. And we got into renewables in about 2004 with a program called CREBS, Clean Renewable Energy Bonds. And we would help towns apply for applications for these basically interest-free bonds. Um, for that first allocation, we represented about 40% of all the dollars that were allocated. Okay. Uh, not only do we do wind, but we also do projects in uh, solar and biomass. Um, on the next slide, I'll just go into a little bit more of that. Our main involvement in wind is through a uh, company in which we're majority owners called Allen Renewable Energy. I'll go into that on the next slide. But uh, just real quickly, as a note, with Sin Solar, um, we are owners in a company called Sedison and Grow Solar, which is based in uh, White River Junction, Vermont, and is one of the uh, largest solar distributors in the country, as well as one of the largest solar installers in New England. And we also uh, own a uh, 
project in development in New Mexico called Estancia, and it's a biomass plant. And what we're essentially doing is taking uh, waste trees and converting them into electricity. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, our wind company called uh, Outland. We do development, we do construction, and we do maintenance. Uh, we actually just completed a 20 turbine project in uh, Minnesota, which is a 50 megawatt project, uh, much larger scale than anything we would do here, of course, but just to give you a sense of the projects we're doing. And then in our pipeline going forward, we have about another 1,000 megawatts. Uh, that's probably about 400 to 450 wind turbines. So it's a, that gives you the scale of what we have in the pipeline. And we now have about uh, 75 trained uh, wind technicians. We work through a uh, Botech training academy in Minnesota, and we probably have one of the largest fleets of, uh, of trained certified wind uh, technicians. They're the guys who actually climb up to the top of the turbines and, and do the work. Um, here in New England, there aren't many folks that have that training yet, so we would bring some of that expertise over here uh, with this. Um, just to tell you a little bit about how, how they started, it was started by farmers, five farmers. We looked at an opportunity to turn their land into a, a wind farm, and that philosophy of kind of serving the community still pervades the company. What we do essentially is we go around to farmers. We talk about the opportunities uh, for wind, and in order to tie our interests with their interests, we make them minority partners in the, uh, in the projects as well. Um, farmers are very, you know, very sensitive about their land. And certainly they don't want to lose the right to uh, use it for agricultural purposes. So it's a little bit of what, what guides us. Okay, okay. So now we'll move on a little bit to uh, how wind works in New England. If anyone has a question, feel free to just cut me off at any time. I'll talk a lot. Um, certainly when you see on this map the most colorful areas, we want to be as close to purple or as red as possible. And certainly the areas along the coast are, are feasible for wind. When you see those commercials with the wind turbines, uh, generally they're in the Midwest, corn farms or in Texas along the plains, um, but some of the areas along the coast of New England are, are comparable or almost as comparable to these, uh, to these giant wind farms in the Midwest. And that's really what we're targeting uh, for placing wind turbines throughout the area. To drill down on the next slide is specifically within Rhode Island. Certainly, you see there's a pretty quick fall off as, as you move off the coast in terms of the wind speeds. And just uh, FYI, in the wind industry, we think of wind speeds in terms of meters per second, but we can translate that into miles per hour as well. Generally, what we're looking for, a rule of thumb, is about 6.5 meters per second or greater. Okay. We think that Tivin and Little Compton, have, uh, from an onshore perspective, have some of the best wind resources in the state. I will be accompanied by the symphony now. Okay. <laughs> um, Bill had mentioned virtual net metering, and that's really the key to what has changed just in the last uh, six months. Uh, prior to this, wherever you place the wind turbine, you can only offset the consumption or the bill at that site. So if you put it on the landfill, you could only use that against the bill of the landfill. Didn't really do much for towns because really your bills are all over. Your biggest bill might come from the schools, and you really didn't want to put one on the football field. Your second, your other big bill might come from street lamps, and you really, you know, you, there's not much you can do there because you may have meters throughout the town. What this legislation now said is you can put the turbine wherever you have land on the town. It can first be credited towards the bill there, and then any excess you generate can now be applied to any other bill throughout the town as long as it's the same customer on the bill, as long as it's the town of Tiverton. So this really opens up the door now for for wind development uh, for municipalities. And the law has passed, uh, limits municipalities to 2.25 megawatts, and it has to be on town land, and you can't sell it to an adjoining town. It must The power generated within that town must stay in that town. Um, I, I am very optimistic that they will increase those limits in coming years. It was uh, a lot of debate to get to where we've got uh, this year, but like anything else at the state has, you know, the process of incrementalism, I feel very positive that it'll continue to change for the better, but 2.25 is a great start. And somewhat coincidentally, Mass passed a similar legislation as well at about the same time. 
Good. Well, just to give you a picture of who has done this in the region already, um, certainly I think everyone has seen or driven by the turbine at, at uh, Portsmouth Abbey, uh, maybe has seen the turbines at, uh, at Hull as well. And then uh, in the western side, uh, in uh, Chimney Peak, which is a ski resort, they put a, a turbine on the top of one of their peaks there in Hancock. But just to provide a, a sense for who has done it locally, you wouldn't necessarily be the first, but you'd still be considered, so I think, an early pioneer and would generate a lot of publicity for doing something like this. Okay. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Wind development is, is complex. This is a, an expensive, complicated uh, development. Um, for every wind turbine, it's roughly about $2.5 million. Um, and in this case, I think to power the town, we're looking at two or maybe three turbines to, to power the electrical needs of the town. So it requires upfront capital. It's never a, an easy uh, time to go to the town to ask for that money. I'm sure you're probably not looking to do that, right? Um, well, it would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe we shouldn't even mention that. But it's also somewhat of a, a maze of subsidies to make everything work. There are production tax credits. There are investment tax credits. There are federal subsidies. There are state subsidies. There's also a lot of red tape from both uh, the utilities and from the state as well just to interconnect uh, into their electrical grid as well as to get credit from the uh, from national grid for the electricity. So it takes a lot of legal muscle, a lot of PR muscle to get something like this done. You're also now in the business of operating a power plant with that, the, the good and the bad. And there would be significant town resources in terms of management and, and oversight and administration to get something like this done. Even just putting out an RFP to get it done would take some effort as well. Um, I think there's better uses of the town's man power and woman power here as, as well. So there's a cost for that. Um, on top of that, it's, it's really wasteful for the town to do it because the major incentives are what's known as a federal production tax credit. And that's uh, basically, it's about 10% of the uh, cost of the turbine. If, that a, we can fold back into our financing yeah. that you are not eligible for because you're essentially a nonprofit. So most of the subsidies that exist today, you can't capture. And this is a pretty common financing structure. It looks somewhat similar like a sales leaseback. So a town will say, okay, uh, bank, you're essentially the owner. We'll lease it back from you every month or year. It's on your books. You take the tax credits, but in turn pass that benefit through to us in terms of a cheaper lease rate. And that's similar to what we're doing here. There's also depreciation benefits as well for the equipment that the town wouldn't take advantage of that, that tax benefit as well. So when you look at all the subsidies available for wind, 60% of that is lost on not-for-profits, and that's why these structures have, have emerged. Um, so this is our solution. Essentially, what I explained, Tiverton is the host of the wind turbine on your municipal land. We are essentially the, the owner buying and installing the turbine. So the upfront cost to Tiverton is, is essentially zero dollars to put the wind turbine there. Um, some folks like the pride of ownership. You know, some towns have said, we don't care, we want to be the owners of it. Some towns have said to us, this makes all the sense in the world. Please, your headache, not ours, sell us the electricity at a better price. So that's what would essentially happen. Tiverton would buy the electricity. Some electricity you might still get from National Grid or Constellation. We would be your wind utility company. For every kilowatt hour, you would have a fixed price for us. If the wind doesn't blow, you're not paying us you know, anything for that. It's not a fixed dollar amount every year. It's based on the actual generation of the plant. So you can say to your, your residents, hey, here's an immediate savings. This is going to cut our expenses from, from day one. What's nice, too, is our feet are, are in this game as well. We're incentivized because we're only making money if the wind turbine is, is turning and we're sending electricity to you. So you can be pretty sure that we're going to do everything possible to make sure that this never shuts down, that it's operating as efficiently as possible, uh, because that's how we essentially pay back our investment in the wind turbine. Okay. Uh, next slide, and I think this is what I'm alluding to, is all of these headaches now are in our lap. So the upfront permitting and the approvals, applications for the government subsidies, any sort of environmental <coughs> 
permits, studying the geotech, the, uh, uh, the geo impact essentially of how we're going to uh, secure these into the ground, any sort of aviation studies for flight patterns to the airport, anything that's necessary, it can add up and become rather expensive. That's now our headache. Uh, applying for the tax and receiving the tax incentives, getting the financing from banks. In the last month, that's something that no one wants to do, is try to get credit from a bank for a project like that. But we have set up these structures and, and have the relationships to do that. Construction it can always be a headache, as you know. There's problems with weather or delays um, that can certainly drag out costs as well. And then maintenance. We already have the team and the crews that can climb the towers and provide the maintenance. And then finally, debt payments. If for any reason uh, it's not a windy year and there is some variability to wind, if you own the turbine, you'd still have to make that debt payment to a bank. And that's a situation you never want to get yourself into. Um, in return, the only thing that you really do have to do is sign a long-term contract saying we agree to buy the power at a fixed price and you'll know what that price is every year. Um, that's it. And, uh, the next slide talks a little bit about that contract because all right, I, I say that's it, that's a little glib. There's some certainly be for signing a long-term contract. Um, but it's what's known in the industry as a power purchase agreement. Uh, it's well known, it's, it's very common. Uh, essentially, you would sign a 15 or 20 year contract. The rates would be at or below what you're currently paying for your electricity. There would be fixed annual escalators at uh, something similar to a CPI, that's essentially just an inflation uh, adjustment or consumer price index. And then each turbine essentially locks in about three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars worth of electricity, okay. And I need to be clear that's not going to eliminate three hundred thousand dollars from your electric bill, but it's going to fix that amount of electricity. Okay. Does that make sense, to everyone? Okay. And in addition to that, if there was some sort of windfall to the town, or you decided, hey, this makes sense for us to own, the tax credits are good for uh, the first ten years of the project. After that, we're fine if the town's interested in buying it out. For IRS reasons, uh, we need to set a price at a fair market value to determine at that point. We can't say ours will be a dollar, um, but there is the option to purchase that. Okay. Um, and so we really feel, you know, okay, this is really better for the towns. Uh, for these reasons, like we said, if you do purchase it on your own, you're really just saying, all right, there's tax, there's tax benefits out there, they're just lost on us. And this makes sense for someone else to absorb those tax benefits and pass them along to you. Do we in the banks take something for that? Yes, obviously. But there's a lot less risk, and you're still taking advantage of a, a majority portion of the tax benefits. Okay? In addition, if you do this, it's a one-off project. We're doing this on a grand scale throughout New England. We have economies in terms of purchasing turbines. It is almost impossible to purchase one or two turbines right now. There is such a demand right now and a shortage of supply throughout the world for wind turbines. So we use essentially, the, uh, we leverage our scale. We're out there purchasing. We have a contract for uh, about $200 million worth of turbines right now. And so we're going to get a much better deal from the large wind turbine manufacturers than a town would buy one or two. Same thing with installation. We're going to install these for multiple towns. So we're going to have a much uh, cheaper installation. With maintenance as well, we're going to have one crew servicing all of the wind turbines in the area. Much cheaper than if you hired, or if every town hired one of their own crews. And then finally as well, uh, construction. You won't have to invest your administration, your people into overseeing construction. You won't have to issue any debt. You won't have to go to the, the town's people asking for a, another bond to raise. We're responsible to make debt payments. That's not on your books. And then finally, this is what we do. We are wind developers, and so you would have to hire someone or someone in the town would have to become a wind expert. And uh, we think that because of that, we'll be more efficient and cheaper at that. We pass these benefits on in terms of a, a price to the town for electricity. Um, if you wanted to get into the charts, you know, I've done some analysis of what this is, kind of you know, purchase versus signing up, and you can see that essentially, it is advantageous not to buy this on your own. Uh, just to give you a kind of behind the scenes look, I, I kind of sketched out the flow charts of what this looks like. We work with the banks to set this up. The banks have the appetite for the tax credits. We work with our uh, portfolio wind company, Outland, to build the project, to maintain the project. 
<coughs> the turbine is here on the town land. And essentially, as the wind blows, there will be a meter at the turbine determining how many kilowatts of electricity are generated. And we'll provide a monthly bill, just like your utility, uh, for that. And that will offset the electricity bill that you have for, and you can determine this, uh, wherever the site is, and then schools, uh, town hall, this building, DPW building, street lights, etc. Okay. So, uh, the kind of how it works slides, uh, if you see that. And finally, uh, we'll start to get in kind of how it would work here in Tiverton. Uh, we've had some conversations with uh, Chris on the, uh, on the sites, and I'll let Bill maybe talk about our initial impressions of some of the sites, and maybe this could be somewhat uh, iterative, and you can give us your sense of what you think the reaction would be in the town to certain sites. Yeah, first off, I want to thank Chris Spencer for his time. This is my third visit here in the last three weeks. Um, I met with Chris uh, to talk about this process, but the second visit was we got in the car and we drove around Tiburon for about an hour and a half, and, and we looked at a number of sites. Um, uh, the first site was the landfill. It's uh, uh, set off the road, as you know, off of 77. Uh, it's high up on a hill. Um, there is not an immediacy of residential communities uh, uh, in that area. I know on the other side of 77 there are, but it's not abutting a neighborhood is what I mean. Uh, clearly there were uh, wind resources up there the day I was there. And, uh, and the other thing that's intriguing about the site is there's a communications tower there. I asked Chris to get the height of that tower for me, and there is a, uh, at the landfill, it's 190 feet. Um, and it would be uh, a, a perfect place to put some uh, weather gathering and wind gathering uh, instrumentation. Uh, there would be a uh, data gathering time period in this if we were to go forward, upwards of a year. Uh, we just can't take a measurement of the wind for one day. We want to see wind direction and speed for a good chunk of time, at least six months at a minimum. You can do computer models to, to project out on that. Uh, so that is a site that I think that holds uh, tremendous promise. Uh, we did visit the industrial park, uh, which I'm sure you've all been out to, which uh, is the road that ends in the, in the cul-de-sac uh, near the, uh, the gas power plant out there. Um, that is uh, an intriguing uh, spot. Clearly, uh, you'd have to clear uh, the land. Um, some of it... So I haven't looked at a topography map, but some of it certainly seems to be in a bowl, uh, which may not be advantageous for us, but there are high points. Um, we did take a look at wooded lots near the schools, which back up to uh, the industrial uh, park. Um, there uh, is high up. I, the best thing I can say about that site is it's high up, uh, clearly, uh, in the town, and there seem to be good wind resources there. Uh, we're not looking for community relations battles in any way, shape, or form, and so um, it wouldn't, quite frankly, be the first choice. I'd have to take a look at uh, the map and find out how far back we could go uh, before we got down into the bowl, but clearly you don't want uh, parents concerned about proximities to schools and, and all those things. And the second, uh, the, I guess the fourth spot we looked at, uh, and I was intrigued by it, was just because it's not a place where you're going to have a lot of public traffic, it was behind the DPW. Um, there is an open space back there. There's actually another communications tower there already where we could get, certainly grab some wind uh, data uh, for, uh, it's close enough where we could grab wind data for the industrial park. And that tower out there is currently uh, 166 feet. So you, all, you can almost visualize some view sheds when you're driving down 24 and what you see from you know, that communications tower, uh, what you see driving down 77, um, from uh, uh, the 190 foot tower. Uh, I'll pass out a photo, and this isn't professional photography, it's not my forte, but that's a shot from uh, 77, and you can see the very small uh, tower that's on that ridge, which stands at 190 feet. And so I think that would help put in perspective you know, what a 215 foot potentially you know, wind tower would look like. Um, certainly, uh, going forward, we'd want this to be an open process, a transparent process, uh, engage the community uh, in any way possible to provide them with information, uh, you know, not only on cost breakdowns, but what view sheds would look like, what this would actually look like. And you can actually do computer modeling to, to give sense a, a firm, 
focus of what those things would look like. So um, yeah, I'm sure there's other municipal tracts of land, but I guess the two that were most intriguing to me were uh, the D DPW slash industrial area uh, and, the, uh, and the landfill. Um, I thought the landfill, quite frankly, held a tremendous promise. Um, that's about it on sites. I'm happy to answer any questions you had on sites. And again, I want to thank Chris for his time. He was very <laughs> forthcoming in for this time. The landfill site, <clears throat> how would you get the power down to Main Road? Well, we'd have to run a we'd have to run a power line um, out there. I don't know what's out there. I did see one outbuilding out there. It didn't seem to have any electricity usage uh, to me. Um, we're not running. It, this isn't a situation, I'm sure you've all read stories about the offshore wind farm and the fact that they've got to run a cable to the mainland. Um, the, with the power generated from one turbine, we don't have to set up excessive transfer capacity. It can be done through uh, traditional power lines. And we'd have to run a power line up that dirt road, essentially, if, there's, if one does not exist. I, I've been out there once. Keith climbed the hill tonight. Uh, because they had the, the road chain link fenced, uh, yeah, chained off, yeah. but uh, I don't recall seeing a power line. I don't know if Chris is still in the room. I know he had a zoning hearing tonight, but I don't recall a power line going up the hill. That's a good question. It would have to be installed, and it would be installed at our cost. We would likely uh, trench an underground uh, cable to the nearest uh, load center, so where the nearest demand, uh, where there's a panel box. Okay. okay. Um, from the town, I, went, I want to talk a little bit about price. From the town standpoint, um, uh, you would have a, a data gathering period of time to determine whether this was a feasible site. Um, uh, and assuming that it was and the town decided to go forward, the t you would not be the, the sole supplier of the town's needs from this one turbine. Town, and this is really a question. The town would still have sort of backup to the grid. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So the the savings to the town, you use the word, a five to twenty five percent discount versus current rates. What's current when they when it's uh, sure? Is it so today it probably, or is it no, five it would, years? It or? would be at the at the time. Uh, this is not a five year process, uh, but it's not a five month process either. No. Uh, give you a sense for timeline. This is something that's negotiated. We look at sites. We then decide, okay, here's where we do some studies. We do some initial studies there. Uh, we need to erect the instrumentation to study the wind. Uh, in this credit environment, the banks like to see six to 12 months of data that the winds that are going to blow at this site, because sometimes it's windy in the winter, but not windy in the summer. And so um, you know, we'll probably have uh, some confidence, best case scenario, you know, end of next year. And, uh, and then in terms of constructing the turbines, uh, getting the turbines here, uh, that could be anywhere from a 9 to 18 month process. So we're not talking about these uh, really turning until 2010, you know, and, not, and probably not the beginning of 2010. So and we were talking about rates that we'd be competing with at that point when we start. But in terms of coming up with this, this discounted rate, you're going to do the, the wind analysis at different sites. And when you figure what the turbine should generate, then we're going to talk about what kind of discounts we get on rates. Yeah, I think what we need to do beyond just the wind speed is an initial screen. We may go up to one site, and uh, environmentally it looks like there's going to be problems there, and so we're not going to we're going to cross that one off the list. Uh, we're probably not going to put instrumentation at, at all four sites. I think we're going to slowly uh, use a funneling process, uh, and maybe it's one, maybe it's two sites that we're actually going to. Remember, with the current net metering law capped at 2.25, that's essentially three Portsmouth Abbeys. You don't, if you wanted to build a 10 turbine wind farm at and you couldn't. Uh, you gen, first, you generate excess power, um, and, and second, you'd be over the, you'd be over the cap. And just another nuance to that net metering law, just so everybody understands this: if you do generate excess power in a current month, all the energy. For the town comes from hypothetically two turbines. Uh, they'll let you carry over that excess credit for the following month, and they'll let you do that for 12 consecutive months. At the end of that 12 consecutive months, if you still have excess generation, 
that's going to go into a, uh, some sort of low energy uh, state fund for uh, low income families. Mm -hmm. And so you'd be essentially losing that off the back end. So the, the, the key is to make sure that didn't happen. Of course, we want to generate as much power as we can, but we want you to you know, receive the best bang for your buck, and, and us too. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, but at 2.25 megawatts, I don't think we'd be talking about exceeding town, town usage. When you talk about uh, that there will be no upfront cost to the town, are we talking literally no upfront cost? Uh, we've had some discussions sure. with other organizations that we were looking at maybe we had to put up five or 6,000 up front to do the initial study. Is, is there any expense like that to the town we'd be looking at to go forward with this if that was what was decided? Yeah, we're really looking at, at zero. I mean, if you consider your time and cost of being here, you know, uh, an expense. But no, there's there's no bill, uh, certainly. This is our project. You'll come in and do the study and check them and all that. And we yeah. don't, at that point, we're not committing any resources. No, you don't, you're you not going to get any invoices from us or, hey, this is on you. We may say, hey, can, you know, we need to do a study with Chris. Can we borrow his time you know, for the day? But, but there's no cost. To, there's no, no bill. Dollars, yeah, coming out. <clears throat> Nothing is if, if the... Um, Let's say ten years down the road, for whatever reason, the cost of oil drops, and suddenly, or, or whatever, gas and, and national grid is charging much less than the cost. That, are we a changing this on a year-to-year -year basis? Are we potentially on the unlikely chance that that would happen? Are we locking into the price that could theoretically be higher than what national grid would be charging? You know, it it may be possible to negotiate some sort of catastrophe cause. Uh, I agree with you; it's highly unlikely. Uh, never in my lifetime have I seen national grid lower their rates and. <laughs> Based on where we're headed now with some of the energy issues, it's, chances are, are very slim that you'll ever see them lower their rates. If there was all of a sudden some sort of magic bullet invented, uh, some Manhattan project and the price of energy dropped, um, it's, it's possible, but I, I just don't see that happening. I think that's something when we came to negotiate the contract, we have to, to open that up for discussion. Just to put in perspective for you where grid is true right now, they've had two large increases this year. After deregulation in 1996, they entered into long-term purchasing contracts for about 10 years. And those are set to expire throughout 2009 and 2010. And when they expire, and Connecticut and Massachusetts saw this, they saw additional 25 to 30 percent spikes in energy. That's something really nobody wants to talk about, and, uh, and I'm not trying to beat up grid, but we got a couple of tough years of rate increases coming ahead of us, the state of Rhode Island, the cities and towns too, because those supply contracts where they get their energy from, remember they're not generators, they're essentially distributors, is uh, the, their own contracts, their own supply contracts are going to expire. And from the, from the uh, perspective of like the taxpayer again, in terms of this yeah. facility, is this facility, uh, it, it's open to property taxes, uh, revenue for the town in any way? Um, Really, we think that the benefit of the town, that revenue, is that savings that we're offering on the electricity. Um, we could... But that would be part of the... That would be something that would be negotiated as part of the agreement. Yeah, we could, we could negotiate that, but essentially we're going to look for, okay, if we were saving you $100,000 per year, if you want, you could take that as a, as a property tax and then pay you know, the same rate. Um, but it's really just kind of a shell game of, of moving it from one or the other. So the other question is, is there any towns around here or anywhere where you're currently doing exactly what we would be talking about, where you would be providing it and we would simply be giving you the land to do it? Is, is there anywhere that, to com that's compatible? We, we are in discussions with six or seven towns in Rhode Island, uh, <coughs> throughout the East Bay, a couple of spots in the West Bay, and Keith has just started doing site visits in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has uh, set up a more aggressive program, quite frankly, than Rhode Island has. We think Rhode Island holds promise, but you know, the goal here for us right now with this initial phase is to be in agreement with 10 towns, you know, 30, 35 turbines. That's, that's our goal for southern New England right now. But are there any areas where this is currently being done that we could sort of look at in terms of our experience uh, to compare? Uh, in this area, there are none that are operating. No. We're the really still in... Portsmouth use. is probably the most aggressive town in Rhode Island right now. They've wanted to go with the self-ownership model. Barrington has been on a fast track to do the self-ownership model, and they've run into a couple of pitfalls along the way with, with uh, how they've approached it. You know, the council put out a fixed price for wind, and a lot of people couldn't comply with that RFP because... They set it at 2.4 million, so they ended up getting a lot of responses that were 
let's say, experimental in nature. And it's kind of just meandered. And, uh, you know, we wish them the best. But, you know, for, you know, Portsmouth and Barrington are probably two of the wealthier communities in Rhode Island. And beyond that, I just don't think it's advantageous for them to go with, a, with an ownership model. Additionally, uh, Barrington is a bit of a, of a different situation because they did secure uh, some sort of interest rate bond for the IRS. So they had some, some cost savings built in um, bonds and programs that really aren't available right now. Well, I guess the question is, is there any, what's, what would be the yeah. closest one that you're currently on? I mean, in other words, this isn't going to be the first time you've done this model in a town. Yeah, let me, let me give you an example. One you have to understand is what really has enabled this to happen is the legislation that passed in July. Yeah, so just we, passed. We really just got started in July, August with WIN. This is something that we do do in solar. Okay, it's, it's very well understood. Towns and school districts throughout the country are using this in solar. Uh, solar requires state subsidies to make solar economical. And the closest state with a strong solar program is New Jersey. We could point to a few projects that we've done through our uh, portfolio companies. But for there. when this would be the first one using this model that, you, that you're involved in? In this model in this area, again, we own wind farms in the Midwest, but this is a brand new law that's allowing us to come out yeah. to this district. And we had superficial conversations with some cities and towns, but the bill kept moving. Yeah, as, as you know, the General Assembly process, and it, it got to a point where we almost suspended the conversations because we didn't know what to say, uh, and we didn't know if it was going to pass. Um, it was a, a lot of attention brought to a bill that was vetoed called the Long-Term Contracting Bill, and that can impact municipalities greatly uh, as well. Um, Maybe think of it when you ask the, the tax question, because what that would allow, and I do believe that would be overridden uh, in, in January, what that would allow you to do is Hypothetically, if Tiverton had a brownfield, and it was never going to be anything, um, and we wanted to build a solar farm there, we would approach you. We would approach National Grid directly with a proposal to build a solar farm there, and we would enter into a lease agreement with you, where we would be paying you a share of the revenue or some sort of fixed lease. Thereby, we're not selling you the energy on, on, under this program that we talked about tonight but we're just leasing the land and selling the power directly to grid. That was the crux of the long-term contract bill that the governor vetoed, um, that it's going to have to be revisited because some sort of long-term contract bill, I don't want to get too heavy into this, uh, but some sort of long-term contract bill is going to have to be passed by the General Assembly and signed by the governor. It even affects the offshore wind farm. Um, so it can't have that offshore wind farm that the governor just announced a developer cannot enter into an agreement with grid without that bill. So. That's coming when it comes, whether it's January or a refitted bill this year. Uh, we'll see. The, uh, Let me just add to that, if I can, real quickly. Um, this is actually a better program because essentially the value of the electricity you're getting is avoiding paying National Grid their retail rate. And their retail rates are about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. If you were to sell the power directly to National Grid, they're going to negotiate their wholesale rates for the power, which are about 6 cents, 7 cents. Um, so it's a better deal to essentially avoid the bill rather than to sell to them at wholesale cost. Have you had a chance to, um, the recent bailout bill, yeah. or rescue bill as the case may be, yeah. uh, it has been reported that when the Senate added their provisions, yeah. some of them were uh, related to solar yes. uh, energy and wind power. Have you had a chance to analyze what those provisions are? Absolutely, yeah. And how it would affect projects of this type? Sure. Um, so absolutely, that is correct. The uh, bailout bill did include provisions uh, for renewable energy. These are provisions that the renewable energy industry has been lobbying for for the last two years um, and had been uh, voted down about 15 times. So it was a fight that we had been taking on for a while. Essentially, when I talk about these tax credits that would be lost on yeah. the town, they come up for renewal every two years. For whatever reason, they won't make them a, a long-term program. And they were up for expiration at the end of this year, December 31st, 2008. Well, we were getting really worried. What were we going to do come January with projects? And essentially, the industry would shut down. You wouldn't see anyone putting up wind turbines or solar panels. Uh, what they did with the, uh, the bailout bill is they included provisions that extend the tax credits both for wind and for solar, uh, for one year for wind and eight years for solar. Okay. Any other questions? What type of, what size wind turbine are you, are you 
thinking about yeah. persimmon. So we currently have relationships with a few, few manufacturers mm -hmm. and we're considering different models. It would probably be anywhere between a wind turbine uh, that is size between 750 kilowatts mm -hmm. and maybe 1.5 to 1.8 megawatts or 1,800 kilowatts. Uh, that's how we size wind turbines in terms of capacity. Uh, that's somewhat similar, I think, to uh, the wind turbines at Hull. I think the ones in Portsmouth were about 660. 660s. 660s, yeah. What about the supply and the demand? Everybody's saying that if everybody wants them, then they can't get them fast enough. Would you be able to get it? Yeah, well, the nice thing is that we have already signed a contract with a major supplier to, for $200 million worth of turbines. And uh, because of the scale of what we're looking for for this initiative as well, and some of the relationships we already have, this is not a discussion we're starting today. Um, we're very confident we'll be able to secure wind turbines. So it makes going it alone even more difficult. There's, there's even a waiting list in this country for cranes right now to install the turbines. So it's, it's uh, you're ready to reference the waiting list. Any other questions from the council before we move on to our next items? I want to thank you for your very realistic uh, <coughs> presentation to us. Um, thank you. Appreciate being that here. That is uh, very useful for us. Yeah. And, um, we appreciate your candor and your explanation. Yeah. Thank you. When would, when would uh, this, uh, what do I want to call it? Study. this opportunity be made available for the civilians, uh, the non-governmental uh, segments of our community? Sure. Is that, is that like in your backyard or on the land or something like that? Well, if, if the town neighborhoods formed associations and put up um, put up a um, turbine, would they be subject to this limit of 2.5 megawatts, is it? Yeah. There's, our, you know, there's already they? discussion to, to look at the bill that passed last year. Um, you need to understand this legislature. Two years ago, this was unheard of in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, for the whole net metering concept was dead on arrival up there. So they've come a long way in the last couple of years. I think it'll change. There's already discussion about including state properties and, and universities and colleges uh, next year as an amendment and in increasing the 225. So, but you make an excellent point about uh, uh, an individual who owns a large tract of land like these farmers in Minnesota who can enter the renewable business but wouldn't have a way to essentially sell the power without the law changing. So the short, the short answer is the law needs to change. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very oh, much. We didn't take up too much time. No, thank you very much. When would you be thinking of locating some uh, <coughs> detection equipment on those two towers? Uh, once we started moving through the process of uh, filtering the sites and determining where, I think that would probably take two or three months, and then so it's probably the beginning of uh, 09 or some, sometime in 09. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to contact us with any follow-up questions. Thank you.